the sermon, The Tyranny of, si of Time. The preacher is getting under our skin. He's doing it deliberately. He's causing an irritation. It's been disturbing as we've listened to what he's had to say. He wants to think, us to think about things that we'd rather not think about. He wants to show us a mirror at life as it is under the sun. Life without thought of God or, or, or life existed just from our own strength. He wants to show us what it's really like and how meaningless it is. You remember what he said right at the beginning in verse 2 of chapter 1? Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And then last week, that, that, that repetition of it was all grievous because it was all vanity and a striving after the wind. Like chasing after air. Something you want to grab hold of. It's a bit like a, where it says uh, vanity, vanity or meaningless, meaningless. The word is like, it's vapour. It's like smoke. You know, the thing that looks solid, but when you try and grab it, it just disappears into a handful of nothing. And remember what he's doing? is he's looking at life under the sun. He's got like some blinkers on, like the horses wear. And he's saying, look, we're not going to think about what God might do. We're going to think mainly about what life is like in our own strength. And, and, and sometimes it seems depressing, but this is the reality of what life's like when we part God. Seeing what life is like from a human point of view and a human point of view only... In a, in a unique way, the preacher is helping us not to look to ourselves for the answers. He's leading us to a place where we will cry out to him, what's above the sun? Forget all this under the sun. We want, we want to know some answers from above. We, we want to hear from above the sun, or let's say in the sun, S-O-N. And as we come to chapter 3, we get this amazing topic of time. There's nothing like a clicking, a, a ticking tock, a ticking tock, a ticking clock to make you think of time. Tick tock, tick tock. I, I don't know about you, but um, some people absolutely love a clock that makes a ticking tocking noise, and other people don't like them. And so when, when we needed a new alarm clock, and I said to Caroline, what, what shall I get? And she said, get one that ticks really loudly. She loves a, a loud ticking clock. You can hear the seconds go by. If you sit still enough, you might even feel your own ticking clock. Your little pump in your chest, your heart, tick, tock, tick, tock. And it's a reminder, isn't it? But one day, that will stop. Like, like, like he says in verse 20 of chapter 3, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. What are we to make of this relentless tick-tock, or the relentless beat of our heart? The preacher's going to tell us, basically, we don't know the answers, but God does. So, three things about time that I want to mention. Firstly, time is puzzling to us, from verses 1 to 10. Time is puzzling to us. You know, the, the poem here at the beginning of chapter 3 is probably the most famous verses from Ecclesiastes. You probably, if someone knew anything from Ecclesiastes, these would be what they would know. They're a famous section of the book, and they're used... I know Caroline used to say her, her, her head teacher used to read at assemblies regularly at the beginning or the end of term. Or you might have heard them at a funeral. It includes those words, doesn't it? A time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to be born and a time to die. F famous. And, and there's, a, there's something really attractive about the way it's written. It's a lovely poem. It's got like a strong rhythm. It, it captures all the various seasons of life in just a few words. There's so many things that it conjures up, I don't know if you, as you read it, it reminds you of things that happened in your life when you were doing some of those things. An evocative poem. It covers such a broad range of human activities. It really is, in many ways, a beautiful poem. But you know, I'm not convinced that that's really the main point of the poem, to make us think uh, 
longingly about our lives, about the beauty of, of things. I don't think that's really the, the main point of the poem. We've got to remember the context of the preacher. The preacher has been telling us that life is vanity. He's been telling us that life goes round and round and round. Um, it, it, seem, it seems futile, he says, in, chap, uh, in several sections of, of chapter 1. He's going to carry on to tell us that life under the sun is, is meaningless over and over again. And so it seems to me that what he's doing here is saying in this poem that life is like an enigma. Life is like a puzzle. One minute we're doing one thing, the next minute we're doing the opposite. One minute we're doing something different, the next minute we're doing the opposite of that. And it goes round and round and round. Read the poem yourself uh, in your mind perhaps just, just now and have a look at it and, and think of it in those terms. That the, the, the poem is beautifully emphasising the craziness of life. That one moment we do one thing and the next moment we do something completely different. One minute we throw stones away and the next minute we're gathering the, them together. One minute it's the right thing to tear something, the next minute we're sewing something up. One minute we're supposed to be speaking, the next moment we're meant to be silent. And so it goes on. And so I think that the writer, as he writes this, isn't feeling blessed. He's feeling confused. He's not feeling free, but he's feeling trapped. He's not feeling delighted, but he's feeling puzzled. Life is full of confusing ironies and what seem to be contradictions, birth and death. Killing and healing, weeping and laughing. You know, it, it struck me, I, 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 I'm not saying anything out of turn here, but, but I, I understand when I've, I've heard about people that have um, autism, that they, they, they struggle with understanding how to respond to various situations. And it's almost like there's something of that coming through in this passage. It, life just seems so confusing. How should we respond to this situation that we're in? I, I think the poem is tuning us in to that sort of bewilderment. And then we get verses 9 and 10. What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the busyness that the God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Do you feel that? that life seems to be one long set of contradictions, one long set of ironies, one time doing this, the next time doing that. Not just the repetition of it, but the way that one minute it seems the right thing to do that and one minute it's the completely the wrong thing to do that. It feels utterly pointless. It feels like vapour. It feels like chasing after the wind. But thankfully... As we engage with another of these uh, uh, thoughts of the, the preacher, he then turns to something that's much more helpful to us in terms of lifting our eyes above the sun. He tells us that time is known by God. And I'm thinking here about verses 11 to 15, that time is known by God. He gives us some helpful glimpses above the sun. You know, already he's given us a few hints but here, in this little section, he reminds us of some things that are really helpful for us to remember if we want to look above this life under the sun. That time is pressure, precious and it's to be treasured. So there's five things under this second point of time is known by God that he points out. They're just quick things. Beginning of verse 11, God made everything beautiful in its time. I wonder if you believe that. God made everything beautiful in its time. Some things, that, that's glaringly obvious. There are just obvious beauties. But some things in life, we struggle to see the beauty in them. But God, we're told, made everything beautiful in its time. We might not understand it in our time, but in God's time, there's something beautiful about it. Everything. B, let's call it. God put eternity into the heart of men. 11b. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. 
every single person that you ever meet, not just in a church, but anywhere that you meet, has eternity written in their heart. In other words, they know that there is more to life than you can see and feel and touch under the sun. You know, that's an amazing thing to hold in your mind when you're speaking to people who aren't believers. Because you know, whatever they say, you know from the Bible that eternity is written in their hearts. So however hard they're trying to push away thoughts of God, however hard they don't want to talk about uh, death or, 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 or life after death or heaven or hell, they know it's a reality that something is going to exist beyond here and now. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that's true of you? And it's true of every single person. It's interesting, it sort of ties in with um, Romans chapter 1. Very different sort of uh, book, of course, but as, as uh, uh, Paul is writing to the church at, uh, at Rome, he's talking about the, the, the wrath of God on uh, unrighteousness. And listen to how he writes, chapter 1 and verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal powers and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. It's not that they didn't know the truth, they have suppressed the truth. They knew that there was a God as they looked around. And so too, humans know that life has an eternal sense about it. There's something eternal about our being. Our body will be laid in a grave. But we, our very essence, will continue. That's what he's saying. Eternity is being put into the heart of man. C. God has limited man's knowledge of time. Do you notice how he carries on? He says... He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. In other words, we don't know everything. We don't understand from the beginning to the end. We know that there's an eternal thing to be dealt with, eternal life to be dealt with, but we don't understand it from beginning to end. We don't know every detail about what God has done. We're limited in our knowledge. It's a time of searching. It's a time of pursuing. It's a time of seeking out God. What else does he tell us that's above the sun? Time is God's gift to man, verses 12 and 13. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Time to do good. Time to enjoy food, to enjoy drink. Time to work. All a gift from God's hand. A gift to everyone for our joy. And the fact that God is giving it to us reminds us, the last thing, is that God reigns over time. In fact, it belongs to him. So verses 14 and 15. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been and which is to be already has been and God seeks what has been driven away. It's reminding us that God reigns over time. In that sense of your tick, tock, tick, tock of your life and of what we would see as the ups and downs of life, wonder where you are at the moment, up or a down, you need to remember that time is in his hands and he reigns and rules over time. He is in control. He's sovereign over all that happens, past, present and future. Every moment that exists is God's. 
And so in the middle of this uh, strange book, constantly telling us that life is meaningless, constantly saying that life under the sun is so baffling and so confusing, here he brings these insights to us that time is known by God, that he rules and reigns over it, that he's set eternity in our hearts. He sent us on a, on a mission to pursue him and to seek him to find answers. And the last thing I want to speak about is that time will bring the judgment of God. Verses 16 to 22. Our lives are indeed brief. Again, I was reading during the week, you know, who's going to remember us in 100 years? There's not many people that are remembered after 100 years. Our lives are brief. Life seems to go round and round in circles. But don't be fooled. Your life really does matter. Don't conclude from the fact that life seems to go round and round in circles, or that life is really brief, that your life is of no significance at all eternally. There is a judgment to face. Verse 17. God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. Did you notice what he saw in verse 16? The preacher noticed that under the sun, even the, 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 the judgment was uh, wicked. Justice itself had broken down. And you know, I know that there's some of you in this room that have felt that really personally. That something's been done to you or something's happened to you that you know is almost certain never to be sorted out on this earth under the sun. That something wrong was done to you that it's not going to get put right on earth. It's something you've lived with, a burden that you've lived with. And you know the pain of seeing injustice. We're going to come on to it some more next week. But what good news it is to remember that whatever is done under the sun, in fact, there'll be an ultimate judgment above the sun, that Jesus will judge all, and he'll judge perfectly. That there will be righteousness, that there will be true justice. It will be done in God's name at the end of time, if not before. He saw as well that that righteousness had been placed, replaced by wickedness. That the things that people were looking up to were not the things that were good, but they were the things that were wicked. Is that not a, like, a, like a, a, a strap line of our age? That the things that once were regarded highly are now pushed down, and the things that were shunned are now lifted high. Wickedness is being exalted, and righteousness is being pushed down. The problem, of course, comes when we start thinking about judgment on ourselves. For, for a perfect judge will also judge us perfectly. And we know that we do not deserve his reward. And so this is where this book leads us, pursuing a saviour who would rescue us from our sin. It's not just pointing the finger at others. Right though that might be, we find the finger pointing back at ourselves and our great need to be forgiven and set right and saved that we might have eternal life with God. It's true, isn't it? We were dust. We come into the world. Naked we come and naked we go. We don't take anything with us. In fact, the only thing we take with us is our relationship with God. And so if you have no relationship with God, you have nothing to take. And you'll be separated from him forever. The Bible calls that hell. It's a horrendous thing that I wouldn't mention if it was not in the Bible. But the Bible says that our relationship with him through Jesus continues through death. And so when we're made right with him through faith in Jesus, repenting of our sin and putting faith in Jesus... Our sin is cleansed. 
And we are put in a new relationship with God that exists and continues through all of time into eternity. This is the saviour that we need. There's a lovely little phrase. Um, we've sometimes mentioned it at Christmas in, in the book of Galatians where it speaks about Jesus coming just at the right time. It says, uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. At just the right time, God sent forth his Son, that we might be saved through faith in him and have eternal life. So this morning, here we are, what is it, the 5th of May, 2024, the clock still ticks. Who knows how many more days we have under the sun. But these are days given to us to prepare for life in glory. Surely life on earth, or time on earth, is a puzzle. It's bamboozling at times. But it's known by God. He knows the beginning from the end. He is reigning over time today and over all eternity. And he longs that we would find our hope and life in him. Seek after him with all your heart. And if you know this for yourself, be someone who's handing this to others, scattering seeds of hope. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the way this preacher in quite an unconventional way is driving us to look above the sun, driving us to look heavenward, to look beyond human endeavour and to find answers from heaven. And so, Lord, we thank you for these answers that are given. We thank you for the way that we can look to Jesus as the one who can set us free from our sin to look to him for meaning and purpose in life, that we might find in him the perfect saviour who deals with every single one of our sins and sets us right before himself, ready for that judgment that we will all face. Oh Lord, please help us to number our days aright. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>